Hello everybody, this is Dr Christopher White and welcome back for part two of the Precambrian and its life history focusing on the Proterozoic Aeon, part two. So we, as we've already discussed, we are going to see a steady increase in the amount of atmospheric oxygen as we move through the Proterozoic. Now we know that the, this increase in the amount of oxygen is primarily due to an increase in the number of photosynthesizing cyanobacteria. So obviously, the more of these organisms we have, the more oxygen is going to be is going to be produced as a byproduct. So this increase in oxygen levels is eventually going to lead to something which we refer to as the Great Oxygenation Event. So around 2.4 billion years ago, so that's the Paleoproterozoic, the early Proterozoic, we begin to see the first indications of free oxygen in the atmosphere. So before 2.4 billion years, we have clastic sedimentary rocks that contain clasts of two minerals in particular, pyrite and uralinite. Now, the thing about these two minerals is, is they are naturally unstable in oxidizing environments. So that means they can't survive in environments where there is free oxygen, like our current atmosphere. So the fact that they are present in the clastic sediments clearly tells us that there must have been little to no free oxygen in the Archean atmosphere. However, as we move into the Proterozoic, one of the first things we see is we begin to see pyrite and uraninite disappearing from these clastic sediments. And so this is telling us the amount of atmospheric oxygen is clearly on the increase. So this means we're transitioning essentially from the oxygen poor, so anoxic environment of the Archean into the more oxygen rich oxidizing environment of the Proterozoic. So after 2.4 billion years, we see two primary changes to the rock record that indicate the presence of free oxygen. So the first thing that we see are banded iron formations, which are sometimes referred to as BIFs. So a banded iron formation consists of alternating layers of chert and hematite or magnetite. So you have a layer of chert, which is this kind of like more red brown layer here. This is going to be uh, SiO2, so silica. And we also have these more gray layers there, iron oxide minerals, primarily hematite and magnetite. So as you can see, you have this rhythmic layering. So it's going iron rich layer, chert layer, iron layer, chert layer, etc. Now, although we have banded iron formations present in very, very late Archean strata, they become far more common and considerably thicker and more laterally extensive in the Proterozoic. So they become more numerous and larger essentially. Now in terms of banded iron formation uh, genesis about 92% of them form between about 2.5 and 2.3 billion years ago so that's uh, the very very earliest portion of the Proterozoic. Now we do have a few banded iron formations that appear later in the Proterozoic all the way to 1.9 billion years ago but the vast majority of banded iron formations formed between 2.5 and 2.3 billion years ago. Now, the question is, is, well, why do we form these banded iron formations? In order to answer that question, we actually have to go back to the Archean. So in environments without free oxygen, iron will enter solution. So in the modern environment, if we have a rock that contains iron minerals and those iron minerals get broken down as part of the weathering process, the iron that's released will very quickly react with oxygen in the atmosphere and it will form rust. So that's why, you know, when you're driving along, if you happen to pass by a rock that's being weathered, a lot of the time you'll actually see there may be a rusty coating on it. And that's because the iron oxide minerals or the iron minerals in the, in the rock are weathering, breaking down, reacting with the oxygen and producing rust as a byproduct. Now, this obviously couldn't happen in the Archean because the atmosphere was pretty much oxygen free. And so the iron never oxidized. And so this means instead of forming solid iron oxide minerals, it instead went and dissolved in the water. So this, uh, these iron, the, the iron that's being liberated would then be transported by rivers and deposited into the oceans in solution. At the same time, we also have large quantities of hydrothermal seafloor vents, or also known as black smokers, which are pumping out huge quantities of iron-rich hydrothermal fluid into the oceans as well. So we have these two really big sources of iron, 
iron that's being weathered from rocks on the continents and iron that's essentially being put into the ocean basins by submarine hydrothermal vents. And the most important thing is, is this iron that's in the seawater cannot oxidize. So the only thing it can do is it can just sit there in solution dissolved in the seawater. That's all it can do. So these iron levels obviously will have built up throughout the Archean. Now, when free oxygen begins to appear, obviously this free oxygen is going to start reacting with the iron that's dissolved in the seawater. And it's going to produce a group of minerals which we refer to as iron oxide hydroxides. So these are iron oxide minerals that have an OH group attached to them. And the, the classic examples are the mineral goethite and limonite, also sometimes called limonite. And these minerals are essentially insoluble, so they will so they will float down to the seafloor where they'll settle out and they'll form a layer of iron oxide rich minerals. So in terms of the location of banded iron formations, it seems that the vast majority of them tended to form in shallow marine environments. And this actually makes a lot of sense. So the shallow marine environments are where life would prefer to be. They're the safest, the easiest place to live. And so this means obviously you're going to have higher numbers of cyanobacteria in that area. The more photosynthesizing organisms you have, the more oxygen will be produced and therefore, you know, the greater amount of iron which can be oxidized to make these iron oxide hydroxide minerals. So the vast majority of banded iron formations are associated with the shallow marine environments, which would have been absolutely stuffed with photosynthesizing organisms. So once the sediment gets lithified, what happens is, is the iron oxide hydroxide minerals like goethite and uh, limonite actually alter and they form iron oxide minerals, primarily hematite and magnetite. And it's the hematite and magnetite that we can see in the rocks now. So we can see it in this picture as these submetallic gray minerals here. So one of the questions that we have to answer is why do we have these alternating layers of silica and iron oxide minerals. So there's a few possible reasons. The first option is it's seasonal. We think that there's the possibility that the more chert rich layers maybe represent the fall and the winter. So conditions are a bit harder. The numbers of cyanobacteria will be lower and as such a less oxygen will be produced. And this means the environment will become dominated by clastic silicate sediments being deposited into the area by rivers, for instance. And so this would mean that during the fall and the winter, you would build up layers of silicate rich sediments. Now, then that would mean in the spring and the summer when conditions were better and the numbers of cyanobacteria in the water would be higher, that would obviously mean more oxygen. And so during the spring and the summer, you would see a, a significant increase in the amount of iron oxide minerals being produced as more oxygen is produced by the cyanobacteria. So that would mean the iron oxide rich layers would represent the spring and the summer. So that's the first possible explanation. Another possible explanation is that it represents some kind of feedback mechanism. So a good example of that might be something along the lines of, let's say we have an environment and that environment is absolutely stuffed with cyanobacteria and the cyanobacteria are having a really good time. Everything is going perfectly. You know, they, there's loads of carbon dioxide, there's loads of other stuff they need to photosynthesize. And so they go absolutely mad. And so they increase in number exponentially. Obviously, that means you're going to produce huge quantities of oxygen as a byproduct, and that oxygen is obviously going to start oxidizing the iron dissolved in the seawater, and that's going to give us these iron oxide minerals. Now, the thing is, is because you're stripping out the carbon dioxide from the atmosphere and the cyanobacteria need the carbon dioxide, well, eventually they're going to get to the point where they are stripping out carbon dioxide faster than it can be replaced. And so essentially what you're going to have is you're going to have a period where the cyanobacteria are going to be essentially in an environment where there's not enough carbon dioxide. It's going to become quite tough. And so maybe they start to die out in large numbers. And so this means the amount of iron oxides produced is going to decrease substantially because there are fewer cyanobacteria now. And so, in, so that would obviously lead to the formation of a chert layer like the one we can see behind here on the picture. So... Then what's going to happen is, obviously, as the number of cyanobacteria decrease, 
we're going to see carbon dioxide levels are going to go back up because the carbon dioxide isn't being removed as quickly and so eventually it's going to get back to the point where conditions are perfect again for the cyanobacteria and then once again you're going to get this exp uh, you're going to get this explosion in the number of cyanobacteria again you're going to see that exponential growth and the process is going to keep repeating itself it's going to keep you they're going to keep using up the carbon dioxide so they die off then carbon dioxide levels are going to go back up then the cyanobacteria will start to re you know start to reappear in larger numbers and so on and so when the cyanobacteria are around in large numbers we get the iron oxide rich layers and when they're dying off we get the silica rich layers so that's another possible mechanism that would produce this alternating alternate layering that we can see uh, the other possibility is that there's another control that we just haven't thought about. Maybe there is another mechanism which could possibly be causing these alternating iron oxide and silica layers. Now, after about 1.9 billion years, the oceans were fully oxygenated. So this means that seawater and river water were both rich in oxygen by this point. So that means whenever they came in contact with a rock, any iron that was being liberated from that rock would instantly react with the oxygen dissolved in the water. And that means the amount of, ox uh, the amount of iron in seawater and river water couldn't really build up anymore. And so this meant that throughout the early Proterozoic, we see this steady decrease in the amount of iron dissolved in seawater. So if we just get rid of the text, so here's a lovely example of a banded iron formation. You can see we have these submetallic gray layers. So that's going to be our iron oxide minerals, primarily hematite and magnetite. And in between these layers, we have these silica rich chert layers. So this diagram kind of summarizes the basics of banded iron formation production. So we think most banded iron formation production happened in shallow marine environments because the conditions would have just been better for life. We also know obviously that the oceans were full of dissolved iron. That iron obviously would have come from the land and it would have come from hydrothermal vents in the oceans. We also know that obviously that iron would have reacted with oxygen. That oxygen would have come from photosynthesizing organisms and photochemical dissociation, although photochemical dissociation would only have contributed a relatively small amount of oxygen. So it's not that important. Most of the oxygen will have come from photosynthesis. So just to give you some idea of the size of these deposits. So this is a, a single outcrop from the Pilbara in Australia. And you can see just how extensive these uh, banded iron formations are. And this is a tiny outcrop. These banded iron formations go on for hundreds of kilometers. They are extremely big. Uh, this is a shot here of the uh, Sishan banded iron formation mine in South Africa. And you can see this entire area all the way into the back of the picture is banded iron formation. So these things are huge. And, and just to give you some idea, this is the size of dump truck that they use to actually move the ore for processing. So, you know, you can see once again, huge dump trucks because they're moving huge quantities of rock because these things are just so big. Now, the other change that we see uh, as we move from the Archean into the Proterozoic is we see the first appearance of continental red beds. So a red bed is essentially a layer of clastic sedimentary rock, normally a sandstone or a mudstone that has a very strong red color. And that red color is due to the fact that the class are being held together by an iron oxide cement, typically hematite. So red beds occur several times in geologic history. So there are some really good examples from the Devonian and the Triassic. Now, they, they, in, in the Phanerozoic, they tend to mostly be associated with periods where we have large amounts of deserts. However, their first appearance is around 2.3 billion years ago, and the red beds from the Proterozoic aren't exclusively related to desert environments, so something slightly different was going on. So we see the abundance of red beds increasing throughout the Proterozoic, and as we've discussed, hematite cements are more common in continental rocks throughout the Phanerozoic. Now, the reason that we start to see the amount of uh, red beds increasing is because we have a steady increase in the amount of oxygen. So what's happening is, is the sediments that we're transporting will obviously contain some iron as part of the sediment. Uh, 
And because we have a uh, oxygen rich environment, that iron will react with the oxygen and it will form rust essentially, hematite, an iron oxide cement, which will start sticking the class together. So the fact that these red beds start appearing in the Proterozoic is an indicator that we start to have oxygen in the atmosphere because that oxygen is reacting with the iron. Now, the red color of these red beds is actually a post depositional feature. So initially, the uh, red bed would have actually had a cement which was made of uh, goethite. So that's one of these iron oxide hydroxide minerals. Or maybe another mineral like uh, ferrohydrite. So that's uh, an iron oxide mineral bonded to water. So these would have been the original iron cements. But during the lithification process, these minerals would have altered to give us hematite. And obviously hematite has this nice red color when it's in uh, fine when it's in fine particles and so that helps to give the rock its rather distinctive red appearance so the thing uh, so the longer the uh, rocks are lithified for typically the redder they become because that means more and more of these original iron minerals get altered to form hematite just to give you some idea so this is a modern example of a red bed so in this case you can see we have some ripple marks on the surface but you can quite clearly see this beautiful red color which is due to the presence of an iron oxide cement and that can only form in an oxygenated environment so Proterozoic red beds gain some of their color from the deposition of primary hematite. However, most of the red color was actually due to the alteration of minerals like goethite during lithification. So you can see quite clearly, you know, these red beds have this beautiful red color. They're very easy to identify. But once again, they can only form in environments where the atmosphere contains free oxygen. So we don't get them in the Archean, but as soon as we move into the Proterozoic, we start seeing them appear on land. So bandidine formations and red beds are the result of increasing amounts of atmospheric oxygen. Brilliant. Done. Well, not quite. There's, there's one very small problem. So the atmospheric oxygen concentration throughout the early Proterozoic would have been quite low, probably somewhere in the region of about 0.21 to 2% oxygen. Remember, the present atmosphere has about 21% oxygen. Now, the problem is, is this isn't really enough oxygen to account for all the iron deposits. So these banded iron formations and red beds are huge. That means you've got to have lots and lots of oxygen to react with the iron. The problem is, is that when we crunch the numbers, the oxygen level was probably a bit too low. We probably didn't have enough oxygen. Now, the reason for this is, is, of course, not all oxygen will actually react with dissolved iron. So we might have, let's say, 2% oxygen in the atmosphere, but only a fraction of that will actually react with iron to give us iron oxide minerals. So what we really need is we need something that's going to help to increase the rate of iron oxide mineral production using the same amount of oxygen. Now, the way we explain this is because the early Earth didn't have an ozone layer, it would have meant that the Earth's atmosphere was being absolutely pummeled by huge quantities of ultraviolet rays coming from the sun. Now, as these ultraviolet rays pass through the atmosphere, every once in a while, one of them would strike a oxygen molecule, an O2 molecule, in the air. And this would lead to the oxygen molecule being split in two. And so this would result in either the formation of elemental oxygen, so that's just oxygen by itself, or ozone. So one of these uh, elemental oxygen atoms would bond with an existing uh, oxygen molecule and they would combine to give us a molecule of ozone, O3. Now, the thing about elemental oxygen and ozone is they are extremely powerful oxidants. So normal oxygen, O2, is a powerful oxidant, so it will, it will oxidize materials very efficiently. However, elemental oxygen and ozone are extraordinarily powerful oxidants. So when they come in contact with material, like dissolved iron, they will react with it very, very readily. Okay. Now, this means that you are more likely to get a reaction between your oxygen and the dissolved iron. 
And so this means you're essentially increasing the rate at which these oxygen ion reactions occur while still using pretty much exactly the same amount of oxygen because we're increasing the success rate. We're utilizing the oxygen we have more efficiently. And so when we do that, all of a sudden we begin to see, yes, the numbers start to work. It starts to make some sense now. And so this is how we get around this minor issue with the amount of oxygen in the Proterozoic atmosphere. Okay, so now it's time to think about Proterozoic life. So the fauna of the Paleoproterozoic would have been very similar to that of the Archean. So we would have had archaea, so these very simple single-celled organisms, we would have had bacteria, and we would have had photosynthesizing algae. Now some of these uh, colonies of algae, these photosynthesizing single-celled organisms, would have formed colonies of blue-green algae which we see as stromatolites. So life was relatively simple and it was single-celled. Now, the lack of biodiversity that would have been around is not that surprising because the prokaryotic cells, so the archaea, the bacteria, the algae, re reproduce asexually. This means essentially when they, cop when they reproduce, they are just copying themselves. Now, this obviously means because they're not reproducing sexually, it significantly reduces the amount of genetic variation. And obviously, if there's less genetic variation, it means natural selection will not function as efficiently. So genetic change in prokaryotic cells occurs through one of two things, either mutations. So there's some kind of mutation to the DNA or rarely there's another process called conjugation. And this is when two different cells with different genetic material actually actually transfer genetic material between themselves. Now, both of those methods will bring about changes in the DNA, and this will bring about variation in the genetic makeup of the population. However, it's not a quick process. And so this means for a very long period of time, the rate of evolution would have actually been quite slow. So this explains why life in the early, so the Paleoproterozoic, would not have been that different to life in the Archean. So what happens to life as we move from the Paleoproterozoic into the Mesoproterozoic? So as we move into the Mesoproterozoic, we're going to see the pace of evolution begin to increase. So the Mesoproterozoic marks the first appearance of eukaryotic cells. So eukaryotic cells are larger than prokaryotic cells, and they have internal structures which are not found in prokaryotes. So they have these things called organelles, which are essentially structures within them that help to increase the efficiency of the cell. Now, the main difference between eukaryotic cells and prokaryotic cells is the fact that the genetic information, the DNA of a eukaryotic cell, is actually contained within a membrane-bound nucleus. So the DNA is essentially bundled into a nice tight space so it's kept neat and tidy compared to a prokaryotic cell where the DNA is essentially allowed to float around loosely inside the cell. So prokaryotic cells are split into four kingdoms, which is a large increase in biodiversity when compared to the prokaryotes. So this diagram kind of summarizes some of the differences and also shows you the main group. So in terms of prokaryotic cells, they come, into, they come in mainly in two main groups. We have the bacteria and the archaea. Now, both of these groups have cells which are relatively small and the genetic information is not contained within a membrane bound nucleus. The DNA is just floating loosely inside the cell. So in terms of eukaryotic cells, we have four distinct groups. We have the protista, the fungi, the plantae, and the amalia, so plants and animals. We notice that these cells are considerably larger than prokaryotic cells, and we have the genetic material stored tidily within a membrane-bound nucleus. We can also see, because we have this you know, much larger cell and more space inside, we have room for these organelles. So the different types of cell are going to have different organelles in them. So something like a plant cell, for instance, would obviously have chloroplasts. These are the structures that allow these cells to photosynthesize to produce their own nutrients. In the case of animals, on the other hand, the cells are going to contain large quantities of mitochondria. Uh, 
So this table is taken from the textbook and it just summarizes some of the distinct characteristics that each of these different types of organism have. I'm not going to go through it. If you want to uh, take a second and read it, you can. So the first unambiguous eukaryotic cells have been identified in rocks which date between 1.2 and about 1.04 billion years. Now, these eukaryotic organisms are called Bangiomorpha. They were multicelled and they likely reproduce sexually and they appear to be similar to modern red green algae. So over here we have two pictures of some Bangiomorpha fossils. You can see the individual cells, they look like discs. Now, you're obviously asking yourself, well, hold on a second, how do we know they reproduce sexually versus asexually? Well, when we actually analyze the, uh, the fossils and take slices through them, we can actually look inside the individual cells and we can see that there appear to be cells which are highly suggestive of sexual reproduction. So there have been other early organisms so maximum about 1.9 billion years ago that may have been eukaryotes but we are uncertain so at the moment the the earliest ones we can definitively prove are about 1.2 billion years old so an example of the organisms which we're a little bit uncertain about are ones that date to uh, about 2.1 billion years ago from michigan and it's an organism called gripania and it's the earliest known mega fossil. So that's a fossil that we can see easily. However, it's likely that it was actually a bacteria or maybe some kind of very simple algae that was forming a colony. So the sample in front of us contains Gripania fossils. So you can see them here as these medium gray semicircles and circles. Now, whether Gripania represents what's called a mega bacterium, so just one really large single celled organism, or whether it represents a colony of bacteria or algae is at the moment uncertain. Now, one of the other things that we do see around 1.4 billion years ago is we see an increase in the size of cells. So we see cells making it to about 60 microns in size. Now this is important because as we've discussed, eukaryotic cells are typically larger than prokaryotic cells. So the fact that we start to see much larger cells appearing 1.4 billion years ago is evidence that suggests that eukaryotic cells might actually have been around before 1.2 billion years. Now the problem is, is that we don't have definitive evidence to show that these larger cells were actually eukaryotes. The size suggests they might have been, but we don't have any piece of evidence that you know, allows us to say, yes, definitely 100% they were. So what's the origin of eukaryotic cells? Well, the theory outlined for the development of eukaryotic cells proposes that they actually formed from prokaryotic cells that entered into symbiotic relationships. So symbiosis is the development of a relationship between different organisms that typically benefits both parties. And the classic example of this is uh, the organism lichen. And lichen is a symbiotic relationship between fungi and algae so the two of them combine together they help each other out they allow both you know each other to survive and they both flourish because of this symbiotic relationship so in a symbiotic relationship both symbiotes are capable of metabolism so they'll uh, burn energy independent of one another and they will also reproduce independently of one another however some um, symbiotic relationships actually develop to such a degree that one symbiote cannot survive without the other. So it's envisaged that symbiotic uh, proterozoic prokaryotes became so interdependent on each other that they could only exist as a single unit. Now the type of symbiosis that we believe developed requires one symbiote to live inside the other. So this is termed, termed sorry, endosymbiosis. So endosymbiosis was initially proposed in 1905. However, it wasn't until 1970 that convincing evidence of the process actually went and emerged. So a study of modern eukaryotic cells have noted that the organelles within the eukaryotic cells, so something like mitochondria or plastids or chloroplasts, have their own genetic material and they synthesize proteins like prokaryotes. 
So the fact that they have their own genetic material is rather interesting. So normally you would expect the mitochondria would have the same genetic material as the cell in which they are situated. However, they don't. They have their own completely distinct genetic material, which would suggest that what you're looking at are two distinct organisms that came together and entered into a symbiotic relationship. This is also backed up by the fact that the, uh, the protein synthesis process that uh, or that organelles like mitochondria use is similar to that of uh, prokaryotic cells. So that would also suggest that what we're looking at is a prokaryotic organism that entered into a symbiotic relationship with the larger cell and that eventually gave rise to, eukary to eukaryotes. So this diagram here kind of summarizes the basic process. So we're going to start off with our basic proterozoic cell. We have our DNA sitting in the middle of it, just floating around loosely. Now, the first thing we need to do, obviously, is we need to actually get that DNA into a membrane bound nucleus. So how are we going to do that? Well, it just so happens that cell walls will naturally have these inversions form in them. And so it's, it's thought that what would have happened is these inversions essentially would have become so large that the DNA will have gotten pushed into a corner of the cell. The inversion essentially comes all the way across and it just creates a environment right here where the DNA is essentially trapped within an area of the cell. And that would eventually develop into the membrane bound nucleus, which all eukaryotic cells have. Now, the, the other thing is that what we're going to have happen is we're going to have these smaller prokaryotic organisms begin to enter into symbiotic relationships with our cell. Now, initially, the, the, the uh, smaller prokaryotic cells would probably have just um, either sat on the outside of the cell or they will have made themselves at home within these inversions in the cell wall. However, over time, they will have entered the cell interior proper. And at that point, they essentially become organelles. So they become things like uh, mitochondria, chloroplasts, plastids, etc. Now, uh, once we have this, essentially, we can go in two directions. The first path we can take is the incorporation of chloroplasts into our cell. So chloroplasts are the organelle which are going to allow our cell to photosynthesize and thereby create its own nutrients. So if your cell starts incorporating chloroplasts, you're going to end up with plant cells. Now, the other path you can take, the cells do not incorporate chloroplasts into themselves. Instead, they tend to focus on larger numbers of mitochondria and a greater amount of something called the endoplasmic reticulum. And both of these are required for the use of external nutrient sources and essentially using those nutrient sources as efficiently as possible to produce as much energy as you possibly can. So these cells are designed for bringing nutrients in from an external source and then burning them as fast as possible to make energy. So this particular type of cell includes the, the, uh, the animal cells, the fungi and some of the protista as well. So, as you can see, you know, depending on which path you take, one path led to essentially the organism creating its own food and one path led to the organism essentially bringing food in from external sources and burning it as efficiently as it possibly could to make energy. Okay, so this is a good place to stop. So get up, have a walk around, go and get a glass of water, take five or ten minutes to sit down and relax, and then please come back for part three.